Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a cold and not stormy, but night. Anyway, so we're going to hear about a warm subject pretty soon, like plagues. Anyway, that ought to warm you all up, and you have no recent memories, but we'll get to that. But first, we've started back the custom we started with, which is that Howard says a blessing on our evening. Okay. And you can say whatever else you want to hold my hand. Well, I was trying... If, if I could lay, lay hands on Mr. Harper, Dr. Harper, it might be... You can lay hands on his book. Okay, sure. Okay. Our, 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 our Father in Heaven, we, 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 we thank you for this opportunity to, to listen to Dr. Harper about many... about an, an important th thing that you have... You, you, you have allowed and rebuked through history. That is, you know, pl plagues and... Uh, and 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 uh, cl climate change and, and and many others that and we 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 thank you for allowing Do Kyle Harper to come back to us after many some years and 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 teach us. We we ask that we might have open in, in but discerning ears to listen. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Well prayed. Um, Kyle Harper, those are, some of you may remember uh, when he was here, I think it's four years ago. I know Kyle Harper, not well personally, I know him a little bit, but, but I know him because of his books. And I, uh, I, the first one I read was the one he talked about the last time, uh, which was uh, From Shame to Sin, The Christian Transformation of Sexual Morality. And then I went back and read his first book, which was about slavery in the late Roman world, where he established that the Roman cities had as high as 20% slave population, which is the background for the next book. Um, but then let me tell you who he is first. He is a historian. Um, he's interested in the ways that humanity um, has shaped nature and how nature has shaped humanity. He holds this part I have to read to get it right. The G.T. and Libby Blankenship Chair in the History of Liberty. What a nice chair. <laughs> and he is Professor of Classics and Letters, Senior Advisor to the President and Provost Emeritus at his alma mater, the University of Oklahoma, which if Tom Oden were here, he'd be cheering. So, because it's his alma mater too. Um, and... Uh, I asked him once how he got into classics, and it was because of a professor who was a fantastic teacher and made it so interesting that you pursued it all the way to get a PhD, which is quite a ways. So, slavery in the late Roman world, from shame to sin, um, that, that, the first um, slavery in the late Roman world, 2011, was awarded the James Henry Breasted Prize. From Shame to Sin, which was 2013, received the Award for Excellence in Historical Studies from the American Academy of Religion, and The Fate of Rome, Climate Disease and the End of an Empire, which came out before COVID, uh, which got him on the map a lot in those first days. He was called by a lot of journalists. In fact, we even did a podcast. Um, was translated into 12 languages. Um, the latest... Plagues Upon the Earth, Disease in the Course of Human History, is a global history of infectious disease spanning from human origins to COVID-19. And it, he draws on a range of disciplines, including the natural sciences, to tell the story of humanity's long struggle with pathogenic microbes. It was the 2021 prose winner for the best book in history of science, technology, and medicine. And one of Kyle Harper's interests, his big interest, is how to fit this all together, the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities, to, to help us understand who we are and uh, how we got here and what we have and haven't learned in the course of, of time. His next book I read here is a history of animals highlighting, highlighting the ways humanity's success depends on other animals and shapes biodiversity on earth. 
He lives in Moore, Oklahoma, with his wife, four children, and a dog. So we're really lucky to have you here tonight. I have, I have a feeling there are some people who are missing you. Anyway, um, I, I thought that it was high time to have Kyle back, and the subject is kind of timely, I think. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to you. So sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, too sweet. Too. That's so sweet. You're awesome. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you, Howard. That is so sweet. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's really both a pleasure and an honor, genuinely, to, to get to share some of my thoughts and ideas in conversation with you, the, the smartest, most sophisticated, and interesting uh, audience, uh, this side of Oklahoma, anyway, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is still still saying something. It is my second time, although... Uh, I think it's been four or five years yeah. uh, in the before COVID. As Dylan said, yeah. I was uh, I'm so much younger now. I was older than that then, but um, but it's it is good to be back. Uh, I have another book, another kid. I have four books and four kids, uh, as I like to say. As you mentioned, I'm writing a book. I'm expecting. Uh, my wife does not like it when I say that because she's not pregnant. <laughs> Uh, but I am working on another book. But, uh, but a lot has changed in the, the four years um, since I've, I've been here. It's really uh, amazing how different our world is. I started writing about the history of infectious diseases as a Roman historian. I'm trained as a, as a Roman historian. And I got very interested in the ways that clearly the Roman Empire was, was deeply affected by the, the impact of these major pandemic events. And I just got absolutely hooked on... The, the history of infectious disease, the biology, the human impacts, uh, and started working on this. I wrote a book about the Romans in 2017, and I was working on a, a global history of infectious disease when, when COVID started. And so uh, it was really dumb luck to be writing on something that was that interesting. People ask me, what are you writing on now? What's gonna happen next? I usually say alien invasion, just to mess with their head. Uh, but. Uh, I'm not a, a good futurist. Uh, I just got lucky ones in my life to be working on the most important uh, earth-shaking kind of thing that was about to, to happen. But, it, but it's happened before. And so I think it's important to understand uh, the history, why it happens, the past, present, in order to understand uh, possibly the future of plagues. So I want to start with uh, a story by one of the great visionary, imaginative science fiction novelists, Jules Verne. Uh, has anyone ever read The Begum's Millions? People uh, have read Verne. This is the one, uh, that, one of the many that they have not read. Uh, it's okay, it's not, it's not his best, uh, but to me it's an amazing statement of, of the power of his imagination. It's a story uh, that he wrote in the 1870s, really based on somebody else's initial manuscript, but uh, it is a story in which there's two men who don't know each other and they inherit millions of dollars. They inherit a fortune from a long lost relative that they never knew. One is French, one is German. Uh, guess which one's gonna be the good guy and which one's gonna be the bad guy. <laughs> so they take their fortune and they move to the American West. Uh, and the German sets up a city named Steel City where he puts all of his resources into science to build weapons of destruction. Uh, and the Frenchman moves to the American West, sets up a city, where he puts all of his resources into science in order to promote human health and well-being. So it's, not, it's pretty cartoonish, uh, but it's actually pretty amazing as a kind of fable about what the power of science has meant for modern humanity, the power of destructiveness as well as uh, the power of doing good. And uh, it really is, is a powerful fable, and the, the Frenchman in the 1870s builds a city on the, the most advanced principles of public health. And in fact, this is an interesting historical document because the 1870s are really a, a crucial turning point in the big history of the way the human species has experienced uh, the basic experience of health and disease and death on Earth. And the Frenchman's vision, which is very characteristic of the most utopian, progressive thinking in the 1870s, is already that we can give everybody good health. We can get rid of disease. He says, what we have to do is we have to create a new city using science and public health to clean, to clean ceaselessly, to destroy as soon as they are formed those miasmas which constantly emanate from a human collective such as the primary job of central government. He says, if we can just create a clean city, everyone will be healthy and live uh, a long life free of disease. What's amazing about this, several things, he doesn't have any conception of infectious disease. 
Even though Pasteur and Robert Koch are already at work proving that germs cause infectious disease, it's nowhere on the, the map. And this is actually very characteristic of the 1870s. People realize we can get rid of infectious disease. They don't actually even understand the, the germ theory that underlies it. Uh, and the kind of combination of optimism and hubris that I think uh, is challenging, that we can kind of empathize with. He wants to help people, uh, but he also has this idea that we can do it. We can completely get rid of disease and we can bring health to everyone. So what's amazing is that in some ways his vision really is realized. The world from the 1870s on, the world that he envisions, really is the world that comes into being. In many ways, a world of the control of infectious disease. But at the same time, uh, the kind of optimism that he has about the power of science and government to forever get rid of infectious disease really is hubris. Uh, and it really does matter that he doesn't understand where infectious diseases come from because they don't come from dirt or miasma or pollution. They come from microbes that uh, are the causative agents of infectious disease. And it's whack-a-mole. You can control the ones that exist today, but you can't control the ones that exist tomorrow. So the control of infectious disease would, in some ways, paradoxically cause the explosion of population that leads to our human-dominated world with 8 billion people that leads to more and more infectious diseases. So nowhere in Verne's amazing imagination is there any sense of that paradox, of that uh, possible feedback that our very success may, in some ways, imperil us. So, it's fiction, but it's, for me, a fiction that encapsulates one of the really most amazing truths about the modern world. Now, I, I won't give you too many numbers uh, on the final exam, but uh, <laughs> here is a chart that I made that is busy, but I think says uh, as much as can be said about the fundamental transformations of the world that we live in uh, in one graphic. Here you see is the, the entire history of the human species down to about the 1870s. This is before the Industrial Revolution. Life expectancy is low in the 30s or even 20s everywhere. These are the five continents. And incomes are low. Per capita income is below $1,000 in US terms. Most people are poor. Most people die very, very young. This is the modern world. It's a very unequal world with per capita incomes across the world still ranging from about $1,000 a year to $50,000 a year. And life expectancies have doubled or tripled, even in the, the poorest and most unhealthy countries, but they've still doubled or tripled. And life expectancies uh, in the, the most affluent countries uh, are in the, the 70s. So this fundamental transformation in the, the experience of life and death is really driven uh, by the control of infectious disease. Before the 1870s, most people, most of the time, die of infectious disease. Now, we live in a world where most people, most of the time, don't die of infectious disease. People still do because of COVID, because of flu and respiratory disease, because of tuberculosis, but most people die of chronic conditions, of cancer, organ disease, uh, of, of sort of uh, congenital diseases, uh, but not of infectious causes. So this is the, the fundamental transformation that's created the world uh, that we live in. And I think it's a place to start as a historian to try and remind ourselves that the world that we inhabit is one that was very different from the one in the past, and really even the recent past. Only, we're only talking three or four generations, right? It's, it's out of our personal experience, but it's within the, the experience of only three or four generations of humanity. So uh, I think that's why we need a history of infectious disease to understand the world that we live in, to understand why we have the infectious diseases we have, to understand why epidemics happen and why they matter, and to understand why epidemics will keep happening, the future of infectious disease. So there's the, the shameless book plug. Um, I'm a historian. As I said, I'm trained as a Roman historian. I went, thank you, Roberta. I went to uh, subtle yeah, marketing. Subtle. Yeah. Uh, I went to graduate school and spent years learning to be able to read Latin documents. Uh, and I still uh, sometimes do that. But we live in a really exciting time for historians because we're learning such fundamentally new things about the human past. Now, most historians uh, go to grad school and they don't end up studying things like what you see on the right, but what that is, it's a family tree. It's a family tree of the measles virus. Uh, how many of you have ever done 23andMe or Ancestry.com, giving the government all your most uh, personal information? Me too. Uh, 
This is exactly what they're doing, sequencing genomes in order to reconstruct family relationships. Humans are obsessed with, with these kind of fairy tales about ancestry, uh, but really fundamentally what those companies are doing is genetic science, so taking your whole genome and placing it in a, a family tree. This is a family tree of the measles virus that tells us what measles is related to and how old it is. It can tell us about the evolutionary family relationships, about where diseases came from, about when diseases emerged. And sometimes when archaeologists can get DNA from victims who died of diseases in the past, we can even get what's kind of a genetic time travel, going back to understand exactly what diseases were there in the past. So as a historian, uh, I think we live at a really interesting time. And it's why I started to write a book about uh, infectious disease before the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. And then all of these copycats came along and now everybody's got a COVID book. Uh, but some of us were there a little bit first. So we need this history to, to understand why do we have the infectious diseases we have? Because really, I think humans have a, an exceptional disease pool. And I'll say what I mean by that, but I want to start with a little bit of basic biology. Infectious disease is a disease that's caused by something getting inside you and making you sick. So cancer is, a, say, a, a malfunction of cellular reproduction. It's not necessarily, some cancers actually are caused, but most are not caused by infectious agents getting inside you and making you sick. Uh, just because uh, you don't have infectious disease doesn't mean you're healthy, but uh, infectious diseases are caused by things that, that get inside you and do cause some kind of disorder uh, or immune response that, that often cause severe illness. And in pre-modern times, most people, as I said, died of infectious diseases. So what is it that invades you? It's viruses, these little entities that we debate about whether they're alive or not. They're just passive little pieces of genomes, RNA or DNA inside a protein that take over your cell. They cause diseases like influenza, COVID-19, uh, AIDS, yellow fever, a huge number of diseases. Uh, and as a father of four, I can tell you the respiratory syncytial virus, um, as well as the tummy bugs, uh, rotavirus, all these little things that uh, are constantly making us sick. Many of them, many of them are viruses. Bacteria, which are single-celled organisms um, that cause a huge number of important diseases, plague, cholera, tuberculosis, and so on. Protozoa, single-celled parasites that cause diseases like malaria. And worms, a huge burden on human health, particularly throughout the past, but, but even still today, hookworm, uh, whipworm, schistosomiasis, and so on, really a major burden of infectious disease. So we have biologically a wide range of enemies. They all have uh, the same problem. How do I get from one person to another? They can get there if you're touching. They can get there if you're touching in a special way. They can get there <laughs> if a bug bites you and then bites somebody else, particularly mosquitoes, but also fleas, ticks, and lice. They can get there if the, the fecal matter of one infected victim uh, contaminates the water or food supply of another, and fecal oral diseases are a huge uh, burden on human health, past and present, particularly before modern water treatment. Uh, and then, of course, we're all familiar with respiratory diseases that jump from the respiratory tract of one to another. There are a number of different ways in which pathogens are moving between different kinds of hosts. So we share diseases with animals, we share diseases with domesticated animals, like uh, cattle and chicken and dogs and we share diseases with wild animals. Nature is full of pathogens that are constantly circulating among animals. And one of the most important dimensions of human health is the way that we're connected to uh, animal populations. Of course, we know COVID-19 has gone from wild bat populations to humans, uh, but then humans have given it to, to other animals like white-tailed deer, uh, minks, and all sorts of crazy animals that have got COVID-19 from us. So we're part of this big biosphere, uh, and connected network of animals uh, that are related. But the other animals look at us and say, you are really, really sick. You have so many diseases, it is completely unnatural. And just objectively, human beings are really, really strange. We have an enormous number of infectious diseases. We have a really huge number of really disgustingly nasty, violent diseases. And we have a really insane number of diseases that only infect us. So if you look at chimpanzees, our closest surviving relative in nature, they have a tiny number of the diseases that we suffer. And in fact, humans are a huge danger to chimpanzees. Scientists that study chimpanzees have learned they have to be very, very careful because if you give something like 
huge number of chimps have died in the last generation from RSV, this common respiratory virus that chimps are very susceptible to. Humans carry around such a massive number of germs that we're a threat uh, to our relatives and to, to all animals in nature. So humans have a very weird disease pool. The question then is, why do we have so many diseases? Where did they come from? And the basic answer is because we have history. Chimps don't have a history. Chimps, 10,000 years ago, they did the same thing they're doing today. They lived in the rainforest, they took a stick and they scooped for termites and ants, pretty smart. They looked out for the cats that are hunting them, same deal. 10,000 years ago, humans were all hunter-gatherers. They didn't farm, they didn't have cities, right? There were five or 10 million of us. They didn't have domesticated animals. We have a history in the sense of rapid, dramatic, cumulative change. We have cities, there are eight billion of us. We're surrounded by animals that we invite into our homes. We bring big animals into our laps in our houses. It's very, very weird. Uh, and particularly cats are weird, but dogs I get. But right, it's odd in nature's terms to surround ourselves with so many other big bodied animals. We consume tons of energy. So kilocalories per day, a chimp consumes about 2,000. Hunter-gatherer, 4,000, about half of it eating, about half of it burning stuff. Early farmers, late farmers. And then the modern American consumes as many calories today as an entire herd of gazelles. So every, it's true, every single American consumes over 200,000 kilocalories of energy a day. So we're consuming nature, we're bringing it into our own networks, and that fuels the evolution of infectious diseases. So here's the, the whole story of the book. Every time humans invent something new and cool, like spears and plows and compasses and electricity, it has consequences, unintended consequences. Human history, in the sense that only humans have a history, is driven by technological change that lets our populations grow, that lets us be more interconnected, that lets us consume more energy, but it has unintended consequences. So this is the, the kind of paradox of technological progress, is that the very things that let humans multiply and grow also make us better hosts for microbial parasites that just wanna steal our energy, our cells, our nutrients. So human technology is what drives the, the growth of our species and the evolution of our pathogens. So it does it in many ways, it changes the way we we literally physically inhabit the world. So 10,000 years ago, all humans are hunter-gatherers. They are non-sedentary. They're moving around from camp to camp. That means you're leaving behind uh, all your stuff, all your waste. When humans start to settle down into permanent camps, surround themselves with the animals, surround themselves with waste and their body waste and the animal's body waste, humans get an extraordinary number of diseases that can transmit, particularly uh, in waste matter, and humans have an unnatural burden of diarrheal diseases that come from the fact that we live sedentary lifestyles, and it's really only about in 1900 that human cities, human civilizations, figure out how to yeah. prevent diseases that are spread through the contamination of water. When we change the way we live, we change the way that other animals relate to us. This little creature has in some ways done more explosive damage to the human race than any other. It's the black rat. It's a commensal rodent. There are, whatever, a few thousand, 2,000 rodent species or so on the face of the Earth. This is the single most successful rodent in the history of planet Earth because it is very good at living in humans. The black rat, along with the Norwegian rat and the Polynesian rat, are very adaptable to humans. This little guy has multiplied, flourished, and helped spread bubonic plague. Uh, like the Black Death, the Justinian Plague that I work on. So we change the way we live, we change the way we relate to other animals. We change the density and connectivity of populations. Here you see a cholera victim in the 19th century when humans develop fossil st steam-driven transport, railroads and steamships. The world becomes globalized like it never had before. The result is new diseases. The great new disease of the 19th century, the great new disease of steamships and railroads is cholera that spreads starting in the 1810s around the world like never before because of the density and connectivity of human 
populations. Okay, here's another graph that this has a little bit going on. But I was on this publication. I love this story. This is an example of the kind of new evidence that's coming from DNA, or in this case, RNA. So this is the measles virus family tree. You see the human right there with measles. Measles is a very important disease. Um, I'm guessing some people in this room have probably had measles because the, virus, the vaccine didn't come available until the 1950s, although none of you look old enough to have had measles, but maybe uh, you know somebody that had measles. Uh, it's a pretty severe disease. If you're healthy, you're gonna be okay. If you're not healthy, if you're poor, if you're stressed, measles is a pretty dangerous respiratory disease. Measles is a very weird disease because it's unbelievably contagious. So if there was one person in here who had measles, walked in and coughed, and we didn't have immunity, we would all have measles. And it gives you very good resistance. So if you have measles, you have it once, then you're fine. That's why the vaccine is so good. You get vaccinated, you don't have to get boosted. So measles is a very weird virus that only infects humans, and it goes extinct because it spreads so rapidly, it just burns like wildfire through dry grass. And it will go extinct because it runs out of people unless there is a huge number of people. You have to have about 250,000 people in a city for measles not to just go extinct. So what this says is that the genetics now estimate that measles virus evolved about 2,500 years ago in the Iron Age, kind of when Rome is growing. Here are city sizes over time, same time scale. Here's 250,000. What this says is right as humans start to build cities that are big enough for measles, measles says, I'm going to become a human virus. I'm going to split off from infecting other animals. I'm just going to take advantage of the respiratory tract of this city-dwelling population of humans. It's a really amazing new kind of insight that comes from genetics that shows us when humans do things like build big cities. So Rome is the first city of a million people right around this time then new diseases find ways to take advantage of it. So human expansion changes the, the opportunities that diseases have, and they take advantage of it. It's been happening throughout our past. One of the big stories that I think we're learning is that many of our most dangerous infectious diseases are not very old. So you think of like bubonic plague, falciparum malaria, which is tuberculosis and, and malaria are probably the two greatest killers of human beings throughout our whole past. Tuberculosis is a chronic respiratory infection. Uh, Falciparum malaria is a mosquito-borne uh, parasitic infection. It's a huge problem in tropical countries. Bubonic plague is the most explosive disease. It's a rodent uh, flea-borne pathogen. These are, bubonic plague is the most explosive. Malaria and tuberculosis are probably the biggest killers. These great diseases of human history are not that old. We now can kind of start to see the, the history through their Ancestry.com for germs. And these guys aren't diseases that have been around for hundreds of thousands of years. They're products of human growth. They're products of the recent past. They're products of our own history. So it's our own history that supports the, the emergence of these new pathogens. And it's our own history, in some ways, paradoxically, that lets epidemics happen. So let me talk a little bit about why, what epidemics are and why they happen. We've now lived through uh, the experience of a major pandemic in our time. So one of the things that's funny about writing this book is when I was drafting it, you had to explain everything, like what an epidemic is, what a pandemic is, what a virus is. Now everyone's an expert on <laughs> everything involving public health and epidemiology. It's great. Uh, but an epidemic is just a big outbreak of a disease. And it happens when a germ, a pathogenic agent, spreads through a population of susceptible hosts. What's interesting about that, though, is that it means that epidemics have both biological and social. It takes two to tango. It takes the pathogen, and it takes the host. It takes the biology of COVID-19, which is an amazing nefarious little virus, and it takes a unprepared, globally interconnected, jet travel, globalized world to provide the platform. That's a really deep story. Both biology and societies create the conditions. So the social conditions can occur when there's changes in susceptibility. Throughout the past, here you see smallpox, which is very, very 
epidemic, interesting disease uh, in its patterns. It was the great killer of the 18th century. I don't know if you can see the dates, this is 1800. Something happens here in Britain. Uh, one of the greatest scientists of all time, Edward Jenner, figures out that if you intentionally give people cowpox, they get a little bit mild sickness, but then they're spared this horrific disease known as smallpox. It was the greatest killer in the 18th century until Edward Jenner's development of vaccination, the first vaccine, just absolutely puts a stop to it and liberates us from the scourge of what was, what was the most extraordinary uh, and painful experience uh, of humanity in the 18th century. So smallpox is interesting because its epidemic dynamics are actually driven by immunity because it is very contagious. All the kids get it. Then it doesn't really have anywhere to go, so it has to go away for a couple of years and it just infects a few people. Then a bunch of babies are born. Then it burns through the, the dry grass again. Then it runs out of people to kill and it retreats. So it's interesting how complicated these dynamics that drive epidemics can be. So immunity drives epidemics. And we're, again, this is one of these things, we all actually kind of now know this, that when everybody gets uh, resistance, immunity to a variant of COVID, the numbers go down and then it kind of evolves around the immunity and then it comes back. So these are patterns that we can understand very deeply in the human past. And it's driven also by changes in pathogens because just the way COVID-19 constantly evolves new variants, the same thing happens to uh, other pathogens throughout the past. Here you see one of my uh, favorite people. You always, when you're writing a book, discover these people who are just amazing humans, amazing scientists. This is a, a really amazing British uh, country doctor that the establishment thought was crazy uh, because he believed that typhoid fever was caused by a contagious element. And he knew the, the Devonshire countryside so well. He knew everybody. He knew all their pigs. And uh, he could really show that the, the waste and the filth, the sewage was always there. But then when typhoid would get introduced, it would spread contagiously through the countryside. And he was ultimately uh, very much vindicated. So when a pathogen is introduced to a population, it can cause an epidemic. This is a pattern that, that I found deep and deep into the past. And so I, as I mentioned, as a Roman historian, I got interested in this because the Roman world was repeatedly shaken by truly massive outbreaks of infectious disease, like the one that we call the Antonine Plague. It was a destructive pandemic in the 160s, 170s, maybe as late as 190. That we don't know exactly what the biological cause was. A contemporary doctor named Galen, who was alive, describes the symptoms. It's sometimes thought to resemble smallpox, which again is this horrific respiratory viral disease um, that is extraordinarily, uh, causes extraordinarily severe disease, uh, including pox uh, that erupt from the skin. Uh, and Galen seems to describe something that sounds like this, and so people have sometimes thought that that may have been what it was. It's a disease that clearly contemporaries uh, ascribe major impacts to. It was so great it couldn't be cured by any medicine. It was the longest lasting pestilence, like some foul beast that destroyed not a few people but rampaged over cities. It caused destructive miseries of a deadly plague. Why weep for me rather than the plague and those whom it killed? So as a historian, it's been interesting to, to live through the experience of pandemic where even I was probably one of the historians who was taking these sources most seriously before COVID-19, but living through uh, the, the confusion and challenge of a sudden new disease outbreak makes you read these sources differently. This was really their world. They couldn't explain it. And all of a sudden, the world that they inhabited was changed because uh, all of a sudden, this deadly destructive pandemic burst forth uh, with incurable diseases and polluted everything with contagion and death. So our historical sources are, are consistent. This was a huge outbreak. It happened right at the very apex of Roman power, right at the height of Roman prosperity under the emperor Marcus Aurelius. When they least expected it, the empire was struck from one end to the other with this disease. I, I said, I won't go too much into this. We don't know exactly what it was. It couldn't have been exactly modern smallpox. We're now trying to figure out, was it a kind of ancestral form of smallpox? We know that the smallpox virus has been evolving in human and animal populations for thousands of years. We've found other extinct kinds of smallpox in medieval populations. 
So for Roman historians, it's very exciting. You think of Roman archaeology as like Indiana Jones. It's actually not. It's more like looking for viral variants uh, from skeletons and uh, worrying about things like this. But uh, to me, this is really exciting. And someday we'll figure out what was it that caused this. But it was probably a new disease that was introduced into the Roman Empire. The Romans traded with everybody. They traded with Sub-Saharan Africa. They traded with the Indian Ocean, Arabia, with Southern Asia, with India in particular, even with China, uh, both over the Indian Ocean and the Silk Road. There are contemporary descriptions of massive disease outbreaks in Arabia and China. This may have been a global pandemic. It's an area where uh, there were, you know, a few years ago, there's only a few historians interested in this. There's a lot of really smart people debating this, interested in this, and I think we'll, we'll get a clearer picture of it. But this may have been a, a really global uh, pandemic at the height of the Roman Empire. And it has massive consequences. Uh, we can watch some of the, the same things that we've experienced play out. Diseases, infectious diseases are challenging because they're hard to understand, because they affect people differently. They affect people in different social positions differently. Uh, the decisions that, that governments make affect people very differently. So they sow distrust, they sow division, uh, they sow irrationality. Uh, one of the consequences of the Antonine Plague is that the Romans think the god Apollo is angry at them. And there's a huge amount of worship of the god Apollo to try and appease Apollo. It is quite possible that some of the uh, eruptions of persecution against Christians that we see in the 160s and 170s is actually related to the experience of this plague. And Christian sources tell us that they get blamed, they get scapegoated uh, when there's famine or drought or pestilence. And there's a huge wave of, of persecutions in the 160s and 170s that may be part of the, the reaction uh, by the empire and by the public uh, to the experience of infectious disease. So this is a very deep part of, of the human story. What we experience, what we've experienced, uh, isn't completely new. And as a historian, I think that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was, in some ways, in principle, it's not predictable. You can't predict when there's going to be a pandemic. Uh, but you can say that the pattern of history is that epidemics are a recurrent part of the human experience. And that the way we live has created the conditions that are favorable to the emergence of new infectious diseases and new epidemics. So paradoxically, the amazing advances that have liberated us from poverty and from early death being a normal part of the human experience have also accelerated the ecological and evolutionary timescales of disease emergence. So how did we manage to partly control infectious diseases because it really wasn't that long ago that most people died of things like plague, typhus, and smallpox, tuberculosis, typhoid, diarrheal, and dysentery diseases, syphilis, malaria. What happens first is that European governments figure out how to stop the worst plagues. So the worst pestilence of all is bubonic plague. And even long before there's medicine or public health in the modern sense, there's very, very crude, early modern public health, particularly in the form of things like quarantines and lockdown. And quarantine is the practice of, of uh, isolating ships, which are a major form of transmission of plague for 40 days uh, when they come into port to make sure that the plague doesn't spread from the ship to the port. And you can see that uh, these huge outbreaks of plague right down into the uh, late, 16th, uh, late 17th century, uh, stopped. So this is the death rate. You can see it used to be that there was a huge amount of variation year by year, and that goes down. Uh, so that even what we think of as the big outbreaks in the 19th century, like cholera, wouldn't have even been noticed uh, a few hundred years ago. So first, they get control of the really, really bad diseases like plague and ultimately um, typhus. Then ultimately, there's a major transition in the fundamental cause of death away from infectious causes towards chronic degenerative and organ diseases that happens because of industrialization, because people don't live on $1,000 a year anymore, because of germ theory, so the understanding that microbes cause 
infectious disease that in turn allows good public policy. So the provision of things like clean drinking water, probably the most fundamental health resource of all is simply clean drinking water. Um, personal hygiene, as well as biomedical interventions like vaccination. And then ultimately, kind of late in the game, uh, antibiotics, insecticides, and other kinds of biomedical interventions. So all of these in concert have changed the, the basic reasons why human beings uh, die. So here's just one of the last diseases to really get under control in the US uh, is typhoid, which is a major uh, fecal oral disease. It's a bacterial disease. And um, it was one of the last really big killers among infectious diseases in wealthy countries until they figured out you just have to chlorinate the water, just treat the water, kill the microbes in it, and then it's going to be safe to drink. And the disease uh, very, very quickly goes away once cities figure out how to build uh, public water treatment facilities. And it changes our expectations about the world. Here's a uh, reformer in 1915 who I think captures this beautifully, that within the space of a generation or two, in the 19th century, families all had six children because you knew that you were going to lose two, three, four of them. Uh, and it was just a sad but really fundamental, normal part of life. And within a few generations, as she put it, it was within people's power to provide basic health resources to every child. And it became inexcusable to live in a world where uh, children regularly died uh, of infectious disease. So it happened fast. And it happened so fast that in a world where the average woman had six kids uh, because most of them died, all of a sudden, uh, most of them don't die. So what happens to global population? It's 1.6 billion in 1900. Do people start having more babies? No, they actually have less. But because it takes two or three generations, the global population everywhere uh, has exploded. So people didn't start breeding like rabbits, they just stopped dying like flies. Global <laughs> population has gone from 1.6 billion in 1900 to 8 billion today, even though fertility rates are actually much, much lower. So there's more of us, and if you look at that chart, you can look at it in different ways. Uh, look at it like a germ. If you're a virus or a bacteria, what do you see? <laughs> Opportunity. Um, so even though we have new tools, like vaccines and antibiotics, water treatment, we are also, in many ways, incentivizing microbes to be able to take advantage of us more than ever before. And in retrospect, when you look back now, over the last generation, we've been warned that inevitably this would cause a destabilizing new pandemic. In 1991, the Institute of Medicine issued a, a kind of study that was meant as an alarm called emerging infections that said population growth and huge agro, industrial scale agriculture, super cities and jet travel are exposing us to the emergence of a new infectious disease. And they didn't have to look to the future because the 20th century, even as we've gained control over the old infectious diseases, new ones, influenza, polio, AIDS, coronaviruses, have constantly arisen that threaten to break through our system of defenses. So just to take the example of polio, no sooner in the blue line do we get control of one waterborne disease, typhoid, than another terrifying, in this case viral waterborne disease, polio, uh, starts to infect a huge part of the population, mostly children, and causes terrifying uh, course of disease, often with very terrifying uh, complications, including paralysis. So polio is a kind of new disease in the 20th century. It's a good example of the constant uh, threat of new infections as there's new humans. The greatest public health disaster and tragedy of the 20th century is AIDS. It's not an old disease. Uh, it's caused by a virus, the HIV-1 virus is the main cause of AIDS, that crosses from animals to humans somewhere in Central Africa around 1920, spreads in colonial, uh, Belgium, colonial Africa, uh, and then quietly around the world in the age of jet travel, and has infected uh, more people than any new disease of the 20th century and killed more people uh, than any new disease. So it's a, a huge tragedy that's probably the primary example uh, of a new pathogen in the 20th century. And then our least favorite friend, the coronaviruses. There are seven of them that can infect humans in the family. 
Uh, this is an estimate of their age. They're not very old. Uh, they come from modern times. This is a strain, OC43, that probably all of us have had. It's one of the main causes of the common cold. It is descended from a cattle coronavirus. Probably as humans, the modern beef industry grows in the 18th and 19th century. It's a stewing grounds for viruses to experiment, to cross to humans. And we all get sick. Probably most of us in this room have had this stupid common cold uh, that's caused by this cattle coronavirus that leapt to humans, but only a little over 100 years ago. So these diseases, even like the common cold, uh, are not very old. SARS-1, SARS-2 are only the most recent examples of these diseases that have constantly adapted to humans, even within the coronavirus family. So the coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic, didn't come out of the blue. It was absolutely the strictest obedience to the laws of nature. It was not an anomaly. It was uh, unpredictable in its details, but utterly foreseeable uh, in its basic outlines. So what does it mean? It was, of course, the perfect storm, the biology of a virus that was extremely uh, contagious and spread perfectly through our societies. But it comes out of an unbroken line of near misses. Even over the last few decades, other coronaviruses, highly pathogenic avian influenza, which is still absolutely stewing among birds and threatens to cause a major human pandemic, Ebola, West Nile virus, which is scary where I live, uh, Zika virus. All of these are really near misses that have almost uh, become really destabilizing global pandemics. There will be another pandemic, and it's worth remembering that it could be worse. There are diseases that are very, very contagious, that are highly transmissible. There are diseases that are highly, highly virulent. Um, SARS-CoV-2, cause of COVID-19, is a little bit of both. Uh, but there's a big danger zone for something that's just as contagious, uh, but that is even more virulent, that causes more severe disease, that kills children. I mean, one of the only minor blessings of, of SARS-CoV-2 is that it tended not to cause severe disease in children, but that's a freak. Uh, accident. There's nothing that guaranteed. That was just an absolute roll of the dice. We rolled the right number that time. Next time we may uh, well not. I mentioned William Budd as one of the people that I discovered writing this book that I really was attracted to. And I'll close with this thought of his. He says, the members of the great human family are in fact bound together by a thousand secret ties of whose existence the world in general little dreams. And he that was never yet connected with his poor neighbor by deeds of charity or love may one day find when it is too late that he is connected with them by a bond which may bring them both at once to a common grave. I am a historian that is uh, an enterprise that is fundamentally humanistic to help us understand who we are and our place in the world, the way we relate to each other, ultimately the way we ought to relate to each other. So this is a story about infectious diseases and microbes, but it's also a fundamentally human story. It's ultimately a story about the kinds of choices that we have to make in a very difficult and often very dangerous world together. I think history can help us understand where we've come from and how we got here, and that can inform a conversation about where we go. Thank you for your time. I look forward to questions. I'm moderating. So any easy questions? <laughs> OK, any questions at all? What's your opinion on the protocol that was put in place, especially in California with all the restri restrictions? Yeah, I mean, this is going to be the first of 17 questions where I say, I'm a historian, not a <laughs> futurist, not an economist, not a public health expert. Um, so, so, I mean that genuinely. I'm not a, a public health expert, but I think we're all, we're all citizens, and in democracies, we, we do all... Uh, have to enter the public sphere and try and work together to understand how to navigate these very complicated kinds of decisions that have to be made about how to, to balance trade-offs when we think about public health. And so I'd start with um, the fact that there are fundamentally trade-offs. And particularly because COVID-19 got so politically hot, which is not surprising, uh, and uh, is kind of normal from a historian's perspective. I do think that we all need like a cooling off period um, where, where we learn from mistakes that were made and where people with good faith sort of say, okay, 
what should be the, the ways we make decisions about trade-offs? Because I think it's so fundamental to the history of infectious disease, to the experience of COVID-19, and will be to the future, that the reason why these decisions are complicated and controversial is because they affect people differently. And so if you're a person with underlying health conditions that is very threatened by the possibility of COVID infection, your calculus is gonna be very different from a 20-year-old fraternity guy who wants to go out and live life. If you are a parent of small children, as I am, whose kids are going to absolutely not have the same quality of educational experience by school shutdown, your calculus is very different than somebody else. If you're a big business that has cash reserves that can weather out a bad year, your calculus is very, very different from the mom and pop business that can't make payroll next month. So this is why public health calculus is so difficult because citizens have genuinely very, very different trade-offs that they experience. So I just think you have to sort of throw those into the conversation and say, how do, you, how do you best balance those trade-offs? How do you protect people uh, who are vulnerable in reasonable ways? Um, so for instance, I tend to think that masks do prevent people from getting sick. Um, there's a lot of evidence for that. I think it's basic biology of respiratory transmission. And I think it has very low cost beyond being extremely annoying. Anybody that likes masks, I don't, I don't, I, I can't understand you, but uh, we all hate masks. But you know, the cost may be low. The same with things like vaccination. Vaccination is very effective. It's the best way that we have. Uh, things like shutting down schools are very, very costly. Um, shutting down businesses are very, very costly. So I, I think, in my opinion, trying to find the way to balance protecting people uh, under uncertain conditions is the other thing, too, is in retrospect, we sort of know a lot of things about how the virus spreads, what the... Uh, what the real death rates are. In the heat of the moment, those are things that are unknown. So you're making these very complicated decisions under conditions of extreme uncertainty. And then this happened at a time when our country is already struggling to, to be civil, to inhabit the same reality, uh, and where we live on social media, which has changed the way we communicate with each other, it's changed the way we consume information, so, uh, you know, it's, it's been a huge struggle for democratic communities to find the right ways to, to balance those trade-offs. But I think after, after sort of hopefully we, we have a few years where hopefully, um, you know, the, the course of the disease doesn't get worse again, that it provides a chance to step back and say, look, you know, Masks and vaccines really do stop it. Um, shutting down schools really does hurt kids. Are there ways we can, we can find to, to balance those considerations? So um, that's, my, that's my answer. I find that it you know, is kind of in the middle on a lot of those, um, but, but I do think we have an obligation to try and protect people who are vulnerable, but um, there have to be limits to the cost that a society bears to prevent disease. Thank you, and I love this quote. I just think that's great, and I really liked your answer here. My question is, throughout history, this great panorama of history that you just did in, you know, 25 minutes, <laughs> what do you think at each moment, or any moment, and, and it's, it's specifically after this, did humans learn? What did they learn technologically, and what did they learn in their society from this? Because it changed after each of these. And so what do you think might be the lessons we're gonna take away from this latest yeah. plague? Well, you learn that humans learn slowly. <laughs> um, it often takes a very, very long time. I mean, it really does. Plague, bubonic plague was the worst disease in Western Europe, the Mediterranean, for hundreds of years at a time. And there was a ton of, of trial and error. We're, we're very lucky that in some ways, we, because we understand the basic causes of infectious disease, we can identify the, um, you know, 
the causative agents, a virus, and these are some things that can work. So we learn much, much more quickly scientifically, but I think we still, um, as, as human beings, as citizens, uh, we learn in some ways just as, as slowly as we, as we ever did. And I actually, uh, I'll give you this example that if, if you were to ask me, um, you know, what, <clears throat> what will we say about the response to COVID-19 in 10 years from a historical perspective? I think we'll say um, that the, the scientific technical response was really impressive. I don't think anybody believed that we would develop multiple safe and effective vaccines in less than a year, that we'd see tremendous advances in, in testing and therapeutics. And, and I actually think that we'll continue to see over the next five to 10 years consequences intended and unintended of that effort. Because I, never before in history has there been so much human focus from a scientific perspective and federal and private funding on one problem. I mean, we didn't put this much into the moon, not even close. And you'll see the, the effects of that. So I think like in five or 10 years, you're gonna learn that there are sort of basic advances in viral therapeutics, which we're crazy bad at really treating viral infections, right? I mean, you can take antibiotics, bacteria, it's fine. But viruses, our approach is sort of like, either you get vaccinated and you stop it, or drink some chicken soup, um, which is kind of crazy. And so I think you're gonna see like all of these unintended spinoffs um, that come from the scientific and technical response. What, what we really struggled with was all of the social, political, behavioral, communicating to people up front, hey, these are complicated issues, there's a lot of things that are uncertain, there's gonna be some trade-offs, there's gonna be some tough decisions, um, we need to change our mind as we go. That's normal. Uh, and I mean, that side of it ended up being so ineffective that it created more distrust than there was at the beginning. So I think you had this scientific advance and almost this sort of social behavioral step back. And when you look at the, the federal administration's proposal for being prepared for the next pandemic, it is 99% on the scientific and technical side. It says, hey, let's go get better at building viral testing and therapeutics, which is great, except that's the part that we already did fairly well. And I actually think if you were smart, you would say, you need to figure out ways to, to prepare a society. How do you, like, I mean, what, what, because the next one could be worse. Like, it'd be totally, this virus would be totally different if it really, if it really made kids really sick the whole moral, political dynamic would be inconceivably different. So what are you gonna do to keep small businesses from shuttering if you have a new pandemic that makes kids really, really sick? Did we learn anything? Nothing, we have no good ideas for how to do that. So, um, so my thing would be we need more on the human side, the political side, the social behavioral side, figuring out how you can be prepared because there will be another one. We don't know if it'll be next year, it'll be 25 years from now. We don't know if you know, it'll be small, we don't know if it'll be something that is really, really, really bad. Uh, but I think what we need to learn is, is how to be more prepared as communities of citizens, not just sort of like, hey, let's find out a shot to give people because that'll solve all of our problems. We did that and it didn't solve all of our problems. Can you say more about travel, jet travel, uh, otherwise uh, long distance travel uh, in terms of um, remedy? Well, the first, just to reiterate what was the kind of theme is that one of the main trajectories of human history is that we become more interconnected. Going back all the way to the first great transportation technology is the horse. When humans domesticate horses, it's awesome because you can go a lot further and a lot faster. It's what allows you to build cities and empires to trade. So it brings all of the good things of human connectivity, like commercial exchange and big vibrant cities and 
uh, you know, coming to salons and all of the good things in life. Uh, every single time we've done that, whether it's the domestication of the horse, the new sailing technologies, transoceanic travel, you know, European crossing of the Atlantic, the rise of steamships and railroads, the rise of jet planes. Those are kind of the, the huge markers and then little progress, incremental progress in between. Every single one of those has major unintended consequences. So European crossing of the Atlantic has huge consequences for the health of people in Europe, in Africa, and particularly in the Americas because smallpox, all of the diarrheal diseases from the old world get taken over the Atlantic to populations that had never experienced in them, and they're being colonized. Huge consequences for new world populations. So human connectivity has tremendous benefits. Um, you know, globalization brings wealth and cultural richness that enlivens the, the world, but it's just a fact that it also allows networks of pathogens to spread. So you mentioned the, the jet airplane, and again, this is something that's within our lifetimes that, you know, two generations ago, it was very rare to, to cross the ocean. Now it's kind of a normal thing. Uh, so civil jet aviation has m changed the dynamics of infectious disease. It means that basically uh, any infectious disease has a, a latent period that would let it get an infected person from one place to another. You cannot stop the transmission of infectious diseases in a world where there's jet travel uh, because you can't detect it in a, an infected person. And you see this immediately. In the 1950s, you start to see um, flu spread faster and further than, than ever before. Um, you see all sorts of new kinds of outbreaks of diseases that are driven by jet aviation in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and AIDS is certainly amplified by, by global travel. So global travel has all those benefits, but every time we speed up connection, from a germ's perspective, it just makes the, the network bigger. And so instead of being an isolated city, we're just like one big global interconnected population. Um, you, you mentioned remedies. In the past, interventions like quarantine were very effective, biocontrol policy, because it's all they had. Um, there's no reason it shouldn't be in the arsenal of tools when it makes sense. But with, with the connectedness that we have, it's probably unlikely to be highly successful. Um, to, to really be able to stop diseases by blocking travel. It doesn't say it shouldn't be ever used, but when you really conceive of a world where domestically in the United States there's 30,000 uh, civilian flights a day, so we're just completely inseparable. Uh, and then globally as many again. So we're incredibly interconnected, and I don't think there's really any going back on that. Um. I want to go back to that, how societies respond. And it, as you um, kind of did this survey of epidemics, did you see you know, sort of like the best and worst of human communities and the way that they, you know, some, I imagine sometimes there was like communities bonding together and responding in certain ways. Um, and other times maybe yeah. it got really ugly. But I'm just curious <clears throat> what, what you saw that was interesting there. Yeah, and it, it, I mean, it's, it would be a, a kind of a different book um, to, to just work on the, the different social responses. There are a few books that, that kind of do that, and uh, I do think it's helpful and important. There's no, there's no singular formula. Um, I mean, I think that the, the kind of common patterns of communities that deal with it well are ones that, one, tend already to have a certain amount of solidarity, um, you know, it's the reason why like a family works because people will sacrifice for each other because they realize that they're in these sacrificial relationships, their trade-offs are, are enmeshed. Um, the more that communities are kind of like that in some ways um, prepares them, but that's clearly not enough. There also uh, has to be very good communication and uh, very good process as well. Uh, I think this is, this is one of the lessons, for instance, um, about say the rise of compulsory vaccination in the United States. So this is a topic that's becoming litigated again. Um, compulsory vaccination in 
U.S. constitutional doctrines 100% allowed. Um, you don't have a right not to get vaccinated. You do have due process rights. And compulsory vaccination in the United States was entirely created at the, the local and to some extent the state level. And so it came out of very democratic processes where people often, you know, at the township level in a public square where they knew each other were making these decisions. It was almost all at the time done on smallpox. So the stakes were quite evident. People said all sorts of things about the smallpox vaccine, that it doesn't work, that they don't want to do it, they have religious or other objections to do it. And these, these arguments were made. The stakes were pretty clear because smallpox is a very, very dangerous disease, very, very deadly. And like any vaccine, it's not um, the decisions that we make affect each other. So this is true, no vaccine is 100% effective. It works best at the collective level. And so the, the argument for smallpox was made in the public square that it was a legitimate public interest that this terrible disease be kept under control by mandatory vaccination. And it all happened at a very, very local level. Um, and the, it was litigated all the way to the Supreme Court and uh, wasn't, is perfectly constitutional. But the, the court emphasized the really fundamental importance of, of the democratic due process. So uh, the, the requirements were created by duly elected representatives acting on legitimate public interest. And I mean, I think that's a very interesting history to know uh, because it, it feels so different from our kind of like 30,000 foot, uh, extremely polarized, uh, sort of top down uh, approach to things. And it's just, it doesn't mean you could go back and do it that way, but it's worth knowing how those kinds of compulsory vaccina vaccinations were created in the first place at a very, very local, civic-oriented, democratic, process-oriented kind of, of way by local public health boards. So I think you know, community solidarity, good communication about trade-offs, uh, a healthy respect for science, which doesn't mean that science is infallible or, or to be worshipped, but sort of respecting that uh, the trial and error empirical method is how you find things. That's our best way for finding out what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think those are some of the ingredients of the formula, but um, things that, that have, have not worked tend to be scapegoating, um, which is a very, very, I mean, amazingly universal human reaction to epidemic diseases. In the Roman world, it was the Christians who were blamed. In the Middle Ages, it was the Jews who were blamed. Um, and it, it, you know, from the beginning of, of the past to the present, it's always very tempting to sort of blame groups uh, for the outbreak of disease, which uh, I don't think has, has ever improved a society's response. Uh, yes. Uh, is there, throughout history, have you noticed any difference in the number, the impact, the response, the length, based on the religious uh, aspects of the society between Hindu, Christian, Jew, uh, the, the different societies throughout history? Has, has religion had any impact on this subject? Yeah, well, it's a huge question. And I would say I've not thought about it in the kind of uh, global comparative terms that, that you've framed the question. So it would be a very interesting question to try and isolate some of the, the ways that religious values shape experience of and response to pandemics. But it's very clear that uh, religion is uh, fundamentally often at play in the way individuals and in the way communities respond to uh, public health challenges. And, uh, you know, that's, that's true uh, from, from Bud, you know, who's who's motivated by, by his own beliefs and the, the role of medical actors, medical agents who are motivated by their uh, religious values, right through the, to the, the ancient world. I mean, I mentioned this uh, from the, the Roman side that uh, the Roman Empire stigmatizes outsiders as being the cause of disease outbreaks because they think that 
people who aren't worshiping Apollo have brought the anger of the gods. But you very clearly, at the same time, have uh, sources that indicate that the Christian response to these epidemics was really important to the formation of the early Christian community. And so, to give an example of a pandemic I didn't talk about, but it's slightly later than the Antonine Plague. It happens in the middle of the third century. It's called the Plague of Cyprian. It's uh, described both by the Bishop of Carthage, Cyprian, it's named after him, uh, as well as Eusebius, who in his ecclesiastical history preserves some very important documents from the middle of the third century from the church in Alexandria, Egypt. And it's very clear that the uh, ecclesiastical leaders certainly in Carthage and Alexandria and presumably elsewhere, um, responded to what was a huge pandemic outbreak, a public health emergency, uh, with, by sort of mobilizing Christian values that are fundamental to Christian faith that are in the gospel. Uh, but, you know, the, the, say the New Testament gospels don't explicitly say, if there's a pandemic, do this. But it does say, love your neighbor. And they mobilized those values in the context of a, a pandemic emergency in ways that, that contemporary sources say were very important and in stark contrast to traditional civic pagans uh, who weren't doing things like caring for the sick, uh, who weren't in their family, or gathering up bodies. Um, because this is one of the, the big challenges is the burial of victims of pestilence. Um, and so there's a, there's a specific instance that has played out in different ways in different contexts, but of where religious leaders are mobilizing the values of their faith in the context of this emergency that is very distinct and, and ultimately has very big consequences. There's a lot of things going on in the Roman Empire in the third century, but um, it's pretty evident that the Christian church comes out on the other side of those pandemics, a much stronger institution, a bigger institution uh, than it had been before. And it's reasonable to think that that's one of the, the factors that contributes to it. So that's, that's just one example. I like your comparative question and I'll, I'll be giving it more thought. Um, you know, how do to, how to other global religions grapple with, with pandemics and how does that shape their response? It's a very good question. Okay, I think we're out of time. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank you.